feeding of werewolves. Episode 11, Chasing the Dragon. And welcome to Care and Feeding of Werewolves, a podcast addressing issues and current events in the paranormal community. I'm your host, Hazel Thornton. Today's listener writes, Hi, I have a concern about a local werewolf. I have recently discovered that my new neighbor is a werewolf, and despite the obvious issues... As far as I am personally concerned, I do not find this very troubling. My real worry is that I have seen him repeatedly scratching himself and I suspect he has moon fleas. This is worrying in case he passes them on to my dogs. I know that moon fleas are not normally a worry for natural canines, but my dogs are a pair of Irish wolfhounds. It is the wolfish blood that concerns me as I have heard that moon fleas are most difficult to remove from wolf type dogs. Do you have any advice on this issue? Okay, first of all, wolfhounds were bred for hunting and guarding against wolves. They're not named because they're a wolf mix. Their coat's completely different from a wolf's, being less dense and more wiry. So if anything, moon fleas would be easier to get rid of. More importantly, you have some serious prejudices against werewolves. Just because you see your neighbor engaging in perfectly normal grooming behavior doesn't mean that they have fleas. And most know to shift away from any place they don't want the beasties showing up so they don't bring them back home. The assumption that your werewolf neighbors infested with fleas is a stereotype you need to think long and hard about. For the rest of you, If you do find yourself dealing with a moon flea infestation, I recommend starting off with an apple cider vinegar rinse. It also helps if they found an interesting smell and decided to have a roll. Cedar in any form deters the little biters. Adding some chips of them along your property boundary might be worth considering. As for people like the listener who wrote in, I recommend a good, sturdy privacy fence to keep people like them at bay. Moon fleas. Moon fleas are the bane of the werewolf's existence. As we can witness here by this changing wolf's frantic scratching. Uh, honey, that weird pile of eyes just said I have moon fleas. Let me look. Oh my god, they're everywhere. Oh no! Every full moon, hungry parasitic insects hatch in droves flinging themselves into a feeding frenzy, feasting on the magic flowing so freely in the veins of werewolves. They spread quickly, from werewolf to werewolf, biting and nipping and chewing and... We get it! ...before mating, laying eggs, and dying unremarkably. Okay... But what do we do? Calm down and have a Fligo Poof, dear. Fligo Poof is a puffed cheese and liver snack given once a month to get rid of moon fleas and keep them gone. One little poof will keep those nasty biters from being able to absorb the magic from your blood, making them die an agonizing death in revenge for having the gall to bite you. 
and it works in minutes. So down the hatch, dear. That's a good boy. Yes, you are. Yes, moon fleas were the pain of the werewolf's existence. Now, Rico Boof. Potions can be great tools for managing your health. They can help with pain, inflammation, insomnia, depression, the list goes on. For some people, they can have adverse, even addictive effects. Addiction is a combination of biopsychosocial factors, which means that someone can become physically and or psychologically addicted to a potion. There's even evidence to suggest that the magic itself can be addicting. Substance use disorder is complex and can vary depending on the individual and the substance in question. If you have questions or concerns about your use or that of a loved one, I encourage you to talk to a doctor. While the spells themselves may be the issue and not the physical potion, since they're basically shelf-stable versions of a spell, I'll be using the terms potion and elixir today because not everyone can stir a spell, but everyone can take a potion provided they have a corporeal body and digestive tract. So if your experience is different, just imagine I'm saying spell instead. Like with mundane drugs, some people can rely on potions to get them through their day and may come to neglect their other needs or the needs of those who may be dependent on them. Some dealers will mix mundane drugs into their less addictive potions to ensure repeat customers. There have even been cases of addictive bodily substances like vampire blood or incubus semen being used to boost sales. That's not to say that potions don't have valid uses, or that anyone who uses them will become addicted. It's harder to overdose on potions, and addiction can be less apparent, but it's still possible. Especially with ones that have physical effects like celerity, also known as velocity take too much at once or take it multiple times in a short time period and your body can't handle the strain of moving at high speed. Conversely, long-time users may have difficulty returning to normal because their body is adjusted to existing at an accelerated state. For once, I am going to lift my moratorium on discussing love potions and use them as today's example but only when applying them to yourself. Love potions. That's a pretty weird addiction, right? They're actually commonly used to self-medicate because, let's face it, who doesn't love to be in love or feel like they're in love? Love potions affect the same chemicals in your brain that naturally occurring love does. Dopamine, oxytocin, and serotonin. Someone with a biosocial imbalance, whether due to environmental or neurological factors, might rely on love potions to help low hormone production levels. A literal serotonin hit. They could make the object of their affections a literal object, a pet, or even themselves to improve self-esteem rather than fixating on another person. You're probably thinking, why would treating chemical imbalances with love potions be bad if they're not hurting anyone else? Well, magically induced euphoria is a high just like many other drugs and can interfere in one's daily life. For the alloromantics in the audience, you might remember daydreaming about your first crush in class. 
pretty harmless if you're thinking about them instead of quadratic equations, right? Now, what if you were driving or taking care of a child? A distracted state of euphoria that you can't break out of could be catastrophic. Your house can be on fire all around you, but your brain's swimming in the happy chemicals and you're so fixated on your object that you're unaware of your surroundings. After a while, the brain's doing well with the higher levels of dopamine and serotonin, but the high isn't the same once tolerance is developed. Someone can feel like they're not capable of happiness without that ecstasy and might rely on potions for their sense of well-being, even as it causes more problems, leading to a vicious cycle. While levitation and flight are relatively safe if used wisely, long-term use can have the same effects on the body as zero-gravity environments. Reduced muscle mass, bone density, ability to absorb oxygen, just to name a few. Returning to Earth's gravity can be painful, so someone who uses levitation and flight might continue to use them in order to avoid pain. Strictly speaking, this isn't classified as physical dependence, but it is an adaptation due to chronic use that can be difficult to manage without help. In what should come as a surprise to absolutely no one, rage and strength potions are popular amongst competitive athletes, martial artists, and others who rely heavily on strength and aggression in either their professional or personal lives. These elixirs can have many of the same effects as continued PCP use, like inability to regulate emotions, high blood pressure, paranoia, hallucinations, convulsions, psychosis, and physical withdrawal. Recovery from any of these addictions will vary depending on the substance and the individual but most include some form of therapy to develop coping skills and address the underlying issues. For someone who self-medicates with love potions, that may mean treating mental illnesses with antidepressants. Those who use velocity or flight potions may need to manage their pain when using harm reduction techniques. People with rage addiction may need to first focus on medical stabilization before they can begin working on treatment for the addiction itself. Total abstinence may be the goal and the best choice for some, but not for others. For example, someone with a disability might rely on levitation to improve their mobility and quality of life but will still need to manage the pain of returning to normal gravity. Again, that's not an addiction any more than using medication to treat ADHD. It's a risk assessment that will vary according to the individual. For someone else, they may need to first focus on finding housing before they feel safe enough to address their use of pain potions. If you're concerned about your potion use, do some reflection and assess how it affects your life, both good and bad. Discuss your concerns with someone, be it a loved one or a therapist, who won't judge you for seeking help. If you want to improve your quality of life and well-being by reducing or stopping your use, I recommend working with someone trained in treatment for addictions and harm reduction techniques. Whether that's a practitioner within the community or joining a recovery group depends on you and your situation. Although, if you go with human group therapy, I recommend coming up with mundane analogs for your substance of choice and practicing them before attending your first meeting. I should probably sign off with some optimistic platitude, but we all know I suck at those. So I'll just say 
make good choices and be honest with yourself. Thank you for listening. Today's episode was written and performed by Brenna Anderson Dowd. Fligo Poofs, written and performed by Frederick Elmore. Sound design by Frederick Elmore. Music production by Kevin Elmore. Find us on Facebook or Tumblr at Karen Feeding of Werewolves. Tweet us at Care Werewolves or email us at feedingwerewolves at gmail.com. Please rate and review. Care and Feeding of Werewolves is a podcast distributed by Kerfuffle and Chaos Productions and licensed under a Creative Commons non-commercial attribution share alike 4.0 international. All content on the Care and Feeding of Werewolves podcast is fictional and for entertainment purposes only. Content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your doctor or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of an episode. Reliance on any information provided by Care and Feeding of Werewolves, Kerfuffle and Chaos Productions, or anyone involved with the production of this podcast is solely at your own risk. If you feel substance use is negatively impacting your life, please seek out community support. This could mean finding safe consumption sites, support groups, social services, or recovery programs in whichever combination you need most. Recovery is possible.